All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Uh, can you believe today is the last Sunday of 2021? This is the last Sunday of 2021. Uh, for today's call to worship passage, I want us to look at uh, Luke's account of Jesus shortly after his birth, right? Sometime after the birth of Jesus Christ. Whether, let's turn to Luke 2, 36 to 38. Luke 2, 36 to 38. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at the, at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Today, as we gather, I want us to focus on three things and notice three things about this wonderful woman named Anna, right? A prophetess. Uh, she was waiting. She was waiting for the Messiah with longing. She was longing and waiting for the Messiah. What, was, what were you longing for in the year 2021? Second, Anna worshipped and prayed. With, you know, she worshipped with fasting, we're told, and prayed while she waited and she worshiped with thanksgiving when she saw the Messiah. So the first word is uh, waiting. Second word is worshiping. Right? How was your worship in the year 2021? Right? Finally, Anna witnessed to others uh, of coming of the Messiah. Uh, she witnessed that the Messiah had come. This morning, as we as we gather to uh, worship God, let's let's pray that God would help us to. To come with a longing like Anna did, uh, and wait as we wait for the second, even second coming of Jesus. And let's pray that God would help us to worship like Anna did, and then uh, be willing to witness. You know, let's share with one another. Yeah, Jesus has come. As we say, Merry Christmas. We're sharing with one another. Yes, Jesus, the Messiah, has come. The light in darkness. Let's pray together as we worship. Father, as we gather to worship you this morning. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness in the year 2021. Father, this is the last Sunday, and you've been so good to us, faithful to us. You have watched over us. And even this week, I mean, it rained all week. We're thankful that on this day, uh, we, when we gather to worship, it stopped raining. Father, you, have, you are so good to us. And as we gather, Lord, help us to focus our eyes on you and worship you with our whole, whole heart. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise for a time of worship. Sing joy to the world. to the earth.
that rugged cross. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise and honor all to me. Sense of heaven. Now my death, now my death is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled, now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the sun sets Dear Heavenly Father, um, we come before you just fresh off the, our Christmas celebrations with our families, our, our friends, our loved ones, um, just celebrating the season, God. But um, pray that throughout all the celebrations, God, um, may we not be celebrating the wrong thing. May our focus not be on uh, the, the gifts we received, God, um, all the lights and all the songs, God. But truly, um, may we direct our focus once again as we come before you today on your Son. Um, on the reason for the season, truly, God, as you sent your son um, as a great gift to us, uh, a gift that we did not deserve, a gift that we um, received, um, and a gift, God, that a gift that we did not deserve, truly. Um, pray that we just, I pray that we would not forget that uh, your son not only came down, but also uh, suffered on this earth, God, um, and, and died a death that we deserve to die. Um, so, God, I pray that as we just sing these songs, as we celebrate this season, God, um, as we come before you at this time of worship, as uh, we come before you to receive your word today, I uh, pray that we would not forget, uh, that we would not uh, direct our focus to incorrect things, God, but truly on you and your son, and to give your son the worship 
the praise you deserve, God. So thank you once again for this time. I pray that you would be with Pastor Amos as he delivers your message of hope and the gospel message today. May you stand and pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Now, as we come to the Lord uh, in confession of our sins, uh, I want us to think about this past year. Would you think about this past year, right? You know, Holy Spirit has been working in our hearts to sanctify us, tra to transform us, to be more and more like Jesus, right? But think about, have you been cooperating with the uh, work of the Holy Spirit? His sanctifying work of putting to death your old self, including your sinful habits. Think about that as you come this morning. As we read uh, Colossians 3, 5 to 9. Uh, put to death, therefore... What is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. So as we come to the Lord this morning, I, wanna, wa I want us to look at these things that are up there and, and repent of our sins this past year, right? And ask the Lord's uh, forgiveness as we come before Him. Let's pray. The assurance of pardon passage comes from Colossians 3, 12 through 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has complained against one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Father, we thank you that as we come, Lord, the Holy Spirit is working in us to sanctify us, to transform us into the image of Christ, and that is made possible by the finished work of our Lord and Savior Jesus on the cross. Thank you that in Jesus we find forgiveness of our sins, and so we come asking forgiveness of our sins, Father God. This year, Father, <laughs> there's so many things that we have done that need uh, forgiveness. And Father, we thank you that, uh, that your grace abounds, that you are willing to forgive us of our sins in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. And Father, as we come today, uh, may we taste anew that forgiveness. May we taste anew that grace, Father, you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. As your servant, Pastor Amos, comes to deliver your message, Father, use him as your mouthpiece to speak to us the words that we need to hear, the words of hope, the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, may you work in the hearts and minds, especially of those here that knew, do not know you as their Lord and Savior. Work in their hearts to, to know you, Lord Jesus, as, as uh, their Savior. We thank you, Father God, for this wonderful time of worship. We praise you and pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. At this time, Pastor Amos will come... Uh, and preach a sermon entitled, A F Few Crows Later, Nightmare After Christmas, from 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. He'll be reading that for us. That piece is coming undone. Good morning, everyone. How's, uh, how are you all doing? It's good to see you here. I think we broke double digits. I was, expecting, uh, I was expecting less, but the songs made up for it today. It's good to see you all here. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. I'm glad you could come join us for worship today. Um, we've been going through, once a month, Peter's letter, which is written to exiled believers who are persecuted for their faith. 
their whole identity and belief system were being challenged. In the midst of all that, if you really want to know where you stand with your faith, you really know, want, to, want to know where your faith is at. It, it's not a matter of what do you believe. Rather, the more important question is, what are you willing to suffer for? What are you really willing to suffer for? That's been the big section that Peter has been focusing on, is, is our sufferings in this world. Because for Peter, if you know how to suffer well, there's this deep, deep joy yet to be uncovered. And that's why he talks about it so much. There's this great potential for joy. Peter is going to show us why. Let me go and read it first. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. These are God's holy, inspired, and life-giving words. Let's give them our full attention today. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for the judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Amen. This goes to reading of God's word. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we seek for that blessing? Father God, as we come here, we ask that as we fixate our gaze and our hearts upon where true hope and joy really lies in you, Make it more than just an abstraction that we could just put on Christmas cards. But something real, something tangible for all of us to hold on to. Only you can make this possible for us. So Holy Spirit, guide us. May the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Think about your Favorite Christmas movie, best Christmas movie ever. 30 seconds. Think it over. Think it over. All right. That was less than 30 seconds, I know. But shoot them out. Go ahead. Home Alone. That's a good one. What else is there? What? Home Alone 2. Anything else? A little bit more original this time? Die Hard. Good, good, good. Charlie Brown classic. Here's my list. Miracle on 34th Street, Home Alone, Polar Express, Elf, one of my favorites, A Christmas Story, and arguably Die Hard. But out of all these Christmas movies, The Nightmare Before Christmas is the most relatable Christmas movie I've seen. And let me just pitch this to you. Right? It's, for those of you who don't know, it's this Disney clay animation movie that's based on this skeleton named Jack the Skeleton. And he's this slender, spooky-looking skeleton with, the, with a smile stitch on his face who lives in this nightmarish world called Halloween Town. And he suddenly discovers, this, uh, he, he suddenly discovers another town called Christmas Town. And originally, Tim Burton, the director, he wrote this as a poem before it actually became a movie. I just want to read a couple lines to you. Here's what his poem said. I'll try my best poet voice, but I can't promise. Jack didn't know it, but he'd fallen down in the middle of a place called Christmas Town. Immersed in the light, Jack no longer haunted. He had finally found the feeling he wanted. And so that his friends wouldn't think him a liar, 
He took the present-filled stockings and hung them by the fire. He took the candy and toys that were stacked on the shelves and the picture of Santa with all of his elves. He took the lights and ornaments and the star from the tree and the Christmas town sign. He took the big letter C. He picked up everything that sparkled or glowed. He even picked up a handful of snow. He grabbed it all without being seen. He took it all back to Halloween. Jack the Skeleton is really all of us. An outsider looking in at this Christmas joy, wanting to make it his own. That's what we all want. Where we find ourselves, where we all hear the promises of God, the joys of heaven, that it's all coming here in in the birth of Christ his son, yet we feel so distant from it. And suffering can either widen the gap of heaven's existence and our presence here and now like one big nightmare. Or suffering has an alternative option. It can bridge the gap. That's what Peter's going to attempt to do. Bridging this gap of this promise that God really offers through his word, giving us this joy through the birth of his son while we suffer here on this earth. Three things to consider here. One, God knows our name. Secondly, God knows our frame. And last of all, God remains the same. Let's look at the first point. He knows our name. Up front in verse 12, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And when you hear this, it it almost sounds as if this is Peter's way of precautioning us that bad things just happen. So it's kind of like him numbing us beforehand so that when bad things actually happen, it won't hurt as much. Having this sort of stoic mindset, numbing us to everything. But look at Peter's approach here in verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering. Who who rejoices in that? Who rejoices in suffering? It's like receiving a gift that you didn't ask for nor wanted, but you still have to take care of it because whoever gave it to you, they're going to want to see if it's being put to good use. And I wonder if that's how we treat salvation, maintaining our faith just enough to show God that we were appreciative, but really we wanted something else. Sharing in Christ's sufferings. I mean, I'm willing to share in Christ's glory, his kingdom, his inheritance, everything but the sufferings. We never ask for it. And yet Peter doubles down on this suffering with joy because in verse 14, he tells us, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. And then he starts to dignify suffering in verse 16 where he says, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. There's this connection between the spiritual name we possess as believers and suffering joyfully. See, what does it really mean? What does this name Christian really mean? What does it mean to be Christian? You hear it everywhere. It's thrown everywhere. Christian dating, Christian music, Christian school, Christian nation. But I got to ask, does it all mean the same thing? This word, Christian. It's almost like using the word organic for chicken nuggets. I don't know how that makes sense, but they do it. What does it all mean? The Bible only uses this word three times, once here in the book of Peter and twice in the book of Acts. You would think that the Bible, which talks extensively extensively about what Christianity is, would use this word more often, but just three times. And I feel like it's God's way of showing us he, he cares much less about the labels and more about the actual purpose and meaning of words be Christian literally meant Christ follower. 
And this word meant that you just couldn't be partial to this name, as if Christ follower was just another one of the identities that you chose to be part of. To be a Christ follower meant every aspect of your life was devoted to Christ. There was no sneaking around it. You couldn't fake this. There's no neutrality behind this name. So when Peter makes this warning in verse 15, notice here, he says, Don't, uh, this warning of not to be a murderer, a theft, an evildoer, or meddler. One scholar notes that they were probably false accusations made against Christians. And they were trying to drag their name through the mud. And Peter says, don't play that game. Don't fall into it. Don't become the things that they are labeling you. See, in this age of social media, where anyone's name can be just dragged through the mud, anyone can become a meme. Anyone can be made fun of. Anyone can be bullied. At least we can shut off our feeds. But to be a Christ follower, you were the one being shut out of society. No neutrality. Yet blessed are you if you're insulted for the name of Christ and share in his sufferings. Such a strange thing, strange thing to say. Verse 14, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. This language of spirit resting upon you is the same language in Jesus' baptism where the Holy Spirit rests upon Jesus like a dove and the heavens open up with God's voice booming in the clouds saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now that same spirit as Peter is arguing rests upon you. And it's a spirit of adoption where we are all given by faith the name called child, sons, Daughters, it's the name you possess. It's a powerful name where God affirms in Christ, you are my beloved child, with you I am well pleased. Why do we use pet names? You ever wonder that? Why do we use pet names for people who are most closest to us? Names like honey, boo, pumpkin, love, angel, whatever it may be. Why do we use pet names? You know, I, I've thought about this. I've never directly called my wife by her name. It just sounds weird. I've never called her Kathy directly. It's always an indirect reference. And even in our most heated moments of arguing, it's always honey, honey, honey. I've never called her Kathy. And my two-year-old little girl, she picks up on this. And every time she wants something from me or I reprimand her, she always says, honey, come. It's quite effective. I realize this whole idea of a pet name is that I, it's the idea that you're, you're for them, regardless of what's happening, regardless of what the situation is. You're always mine. I'll always be on your side. So this name that God gives to us as beloved children, that's God's way he chooses to address us by, that I am for your good, regardless of what happens. Child. Because in this name, God also shapes our frame through the suffering. Second point here, he knows our frame. Through this name, God shapes the frame of our hearts. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and it begins with us. I mean, this doesn't sound exactly loving, a loving thing to do with God's people. As you call them children, he says, the, the, the judgment's going to start with the house of God. So what's with all this judgment language that Peter is talking about? It's a reference to Malachi 3, where it's prophesied that God would visit his, his house of worship as a refining fire, purging out the wicked and purifying the righteous. He starts with his church. No one wants to think about judgment. It's unpleasant. And so we, it, it's not exactly in the immediate future for many of us. It's something out there far, far away that we don't have to worry about. 
So it's easy to ignore, push in the back of our minds. But if there's an already not yet state of what heaven is, then couldn't there also be a case for an already and not yet for hell? I wish they would develop this more. Judgment. Peter says that believers will endure and go through fiery trials. Again, a word specifically used of judgment. How do you boil a frog? As the fable goes, you turn up the heat little by little, and the frog sits there comfortably until it boils to its death. If bearing the name Christ follower now here on this earth means denying ourselves, taking up our crosses to follow Jesus into glory, then the judgment in this life now is to receive everything your heart can possibly desire with no one to stand in your way. That's what judgment here looks on earth. Let's look at verse 18. If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? See, Peter quotes this from Proverbs not to create this paranoia of whether we made the cut or not, be saved. The righteous is scarcely saved. The issue is not about God's mercy, but rather it's us getting used, us getting comfortable with judgment. That's the frame of our hearts. And suffering is God's intervention to notice the temperature. Notice how hot it is. It's God's intervention. God sent Jesus into the world knowing fully well that he would suffer. And Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. That's what Hebrews 5.8 says. And yet there's the dilemma. How much suffering is enough? How much of it is enough? That's my daily struggle. I, 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 you know, like, Part of my job is to constantly let you know that you need God in your lives. But I find this tremendously difficult in a place like San Diego, where I feel that most people are either chasing the American dream or already have it. So how do I convince people you really need God? Not as one option among the many, but he is everything. And I feel sheepish at times saying this, you need God in your life. But then I think about our country. We're the most prosperous as we can be, and yet we're the highest, like we're, we're leading in uh, prescri- antidepressant prescription pills. We're the most depressed as we can be. We're the most angry as we can be. We need God. Having everything that you want without anyone to stand in your way, it's a form of judgment. can't just make yourself happy because Jack the skeleton tried to take what he wants, become what he desires. My dear Mr. Claus, I think it's a crime that you've got to be Santa all of the time, but now I will give presents. I will spread cheer. We're changing places. I'm Santa this year. It is I who will say Merry Christmas to you so you may lie in my coffin, creak doors, and yell boo. And please, Mr. Claus, don't think ill of my plan, for I'll do the best Santa job that I can. What does that sound like to you? Genesis 2. You can be like God. There were screams of terror, but Jack didn't hear it. He was much too involved with his own Christmas spirit. I thought I could be Santa. I had such belief. Jack was confused and filled with great grief. Not knowing where to turn, he looked toward the sky. He slumped on the grave, and he started to cry. I can't remember who said it, but I thought it was poignant. That when your dreams come true, that's when the nightmares begin. 
both my kids are at this age when they um, wear Kathy and I, when we have to put them to sleep, they absolutely have to touch one of us physically. It's either on our head or the side of our cheek or the back of our necks or nuzzling, nuzzling their head under our necks. That's the only way they'll sleep. And it takes an incredibly long time, very frustrated by this. And so even when they wake up through the night, we have to do the same procedure when they wake up from a bad dream. And finally, I, we just had to ask our kid, one, our, one of our kids, you know, Miles, why, why don't you like sleeping? What's your problem with sleeping? Why don't you like it? And he tells us, well, how will I know? How will I know you're still there? How will I know you're still there? And I realize it's a question we all ask in our own nightmares. We just want something tangible to just hold on to, just to get us through. So we'll cling to our savings, hug on to our careers to feel a little important, nuzzle our heads under whatever will make us feel just a little bit better about ourselves. When what we're really looking for is for God to still be there through our anguish. I realize my kids aren't the only ones who need to cl- something to, someone to cling on to to finally fall asleep. Jesus, he gives us something to hold on to. He, he endured suffering because as Hebrews 12, 2 put it, there was a joy set before him. The joy of redeeming us. And to sh- the joy of sharing that joy. And this promise will always remain the same. Last point. The promise is not this. It's not if you believe in Jesus, he'll make everything bad and sad just go away right now. Peter is adamant in verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Notice the face. Entrust their souls to a faithful creator. There's a sense in which sorrows and sufferings that we have in this life, they don't just automatically disappear. We don't just automatically get to feel better. But as we mourn, as we grieve now, we do so in faith. As we trust that God will one day Make our joy complete. A day in which he really will wipe away all our tears. Turn nightmares into fairy tales. Because we get to, get to finally see God as he is. Back home, Jack was sad. But then, like a dream, Santa brought Christmas to the land of Halloween. When man becomes the creator, it creates nightmares. But when Jesus came, when the creator became a man, he brings joy. Miles asked me this question. He asked me the other day, um, why do grown-ups cry when they're happy? And like, I never thought about it, but I've never witnessed a kid cry because they were so happy. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of you have. But for the most part, kids don't really cry because they're overly happy. Why do kids cry? Why do grown-ups cry when they're happy? Give this some thought. I was talking to my friend, and um, he gave me permission to share about what he's been learning throughout his life. And he's been telling me that he's on this journey of deconstructing his faith. And it's not because he wants to leave God behind. He wants to understand his faith better. And as an outsider, as I look at his life, he's got a great life. He's got a a wonderful family. He's got a lovely home. He's got a thriving business. He's got everything you could possibly ask for. And yet he's on this journey of deconstructing his faith. And yet he was sharing with me during this counseling session that he was in, uh, everyone, I guess, shares about something that resonated with them, something they've been learning throughout the week. 
And so he opened up his phone and he, he typed in this phrase that was just, you know, resonating with him, really ministering to him. And he tells a counselor, you know what? I don't know why, but for some reason, this really got to me. And so he reads it during the counseling session. He says, God has a tender heart for you. God has a tender heart for you. And he began weeping. My friend doesn't cry at all. We don't cry because we're happy. We cry because we've been incredibly humbled. That there's a sense in all of us where in the back of our minds, we don't deserve to be happy. Because we got too much shame. Because I'm a failure. Because if you knew this about my life, you would know I don't deserve to be happy. And yet, God has a tender heart for you. God has a tender heart for you. Ever so often, God shows up with his tender heart. It's not the logic, airtight logic of theology. It, it's, it's not the stuff that you possess. It, it's not any of those things that got to my friend. God has a tender heart. Today, God shows up with his tender heart to give us something tangible for us to feel, to feel his promises. As we participate in the Lord's Supper, that our creator God, who used his tender hands to create us, now uses those same hands to also feed us, to sustain us, promising to do more than make us happy, but to make our joy complete. Christ entered into our nightmare of sin and death, one in which he couldn't just pinch himself awake from, but instead nailed to a cross so that by faith, we by faith, can enter into the joy of God's tender hands, welcoming us. And that's the promise that he constantly offers, welcoming us in, showing us his tender heart, Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father God, the bridge between joy and our sufferings and trials and griefs, whatever just makes us mourn, it makes this gap seem so infinitely large. But as we look to what Jesus, you have done with your tender hands on that cross for all of us, teach us, O oh Father, what it means to entrust our souls to a faithful, loving, tender creator who longs to sustain us, who reminds us that our joy will be made complete. And so as we grieve here on this earth, whatever trials we may go through, we mourn freely knowing that our Savior intends to still walk with us, lead us where we need to be. And as you nourish our bodies now with the bread and the wine, reminding us of heaven's joys, make that real, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go right into the celebration of the Lord's Supper, and we're going to sing as you come and receive the elements. Let me read to you the words of institution from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that, that Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, we... He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. 
do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, uh, on the... On the day he was at the wedding at Cana, you know, he performed the first sign at the wedding at Cana. And after turning uh, the water into wine, Jesus was uh, acting weird. You know, he said things that are kind of weird. And and one of the reasons is because, you know, at that wedding, while people were sipping uh, the cup of joy, this wine that Jesus had made, Jesus was sipping a cup of wrath, right? Because he knew that he would have to take on the wrath so that people can have joy. And we're reminded today, you know, because Jesus faced our ultimate nightmare of hell, that we can entrust our joy to God in our suffering. It is because Jesus took upon himself the cup of wrath that we can have the cup of joy, right? So as we come uh, today, think about the suffering Jesus went through through for you and uh, as we're reminded don't think suffering is somehow uh, you know a way for God to uh, to show that he doesn't love us but he loves us through our suffering and and Jesus has shed his blood for us so that we can have ultimate joy in him and um, I want to invite you to come and share in this joy uh, together Um, This table is for those uh, who are uh, believers, right? This is a table for family members. What that means is uh, uh, we want to let you know those who are uh, believers, who are baptized, uh, can come and participate, right? And if you've been infant baptized, uh, you have to be confirmed. The reason why we do this is because it says later on in the same text that we read, if you drink and eat in an unworthy manner, without recognizing what this is all about, you drink judgment unto yourself, right? Uh, But this table is an altar call too. It's a table that says, yeah, give your life, submit yourself to Jesus, right? Give of yourself to Jesus, to submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So so take the necessary step to be baptized, to be confirmed, so that you can participate in this wonderful celebration of Christ's suffering for us so that we can have joy right let me let me pray for us and uh, what we're gonna do after I pray is we're gonna just come down this way and then go out this way and go back to your seats okay so let's come down this way in orderly manner take the element with you back to your seat and we'll protect protect together let's pray Father, we thank you for the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for loving us enough to sacrifice your only son for us, to to take on the, the nightmare of hell for us so that we can have joy. We ask that as we partake, we will indeed receive the benefits for which you have instituted in this holy sacrament. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we sing this song together, I want to invite you guys to come down, take the element and go back to your seat.
He calls me His own. He'll never leave me, no matter where I go. And He knows my I'd like to invite you guys to open the top film off. Uh, take the top film off. Our Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. And I want to invite you guys now to open the second film, second layer. In the same manner, he also took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Let us pray. Father, we, we look at our suffering uh, in our lives and there has been a lot of suffering uh, lately. And we forget, Father, um, the suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, why he suffered for us and why suffering doesn't mean we're left alone because Jesus suffered, went to the cross for us, drank the cup of wrath for us. Father, we can drink the cup of joy today. Yes, despite all that is going on because, Father God, of what is promised for us in your word. We thank you for, the, for your rich mercy and invaluable goodness bestowed to us <coughs> in this sacred communion. We ask pardon for the defects of the whole service. We pray that you would accept us in our worship. We also ask for the gracious assistance of the Holy Spirit to enable us as we receive Christ. So to walk in him, to put to death our sinful nature and to put on Christ. Help us hold fast to that which we have received, that no one may take our crown, that our conversation may be as becomes the gospel, that we would be about the gospel as Anna shared with all around her about the, the coming of the Messiah. Lord, help us to, to share the good news with all around us. Lord, help us to also bear about with us continually the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested. Lord, that our light may so shine before men in this darkness, that others seeing our good work may glorify our Father who is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, we'll continue our worship through our tithes and offerings. Uh, you can give online at hopepcsd slash give, and you can uh, give in person. Uh, there's a box that back there. Today, not. Okay. Um, you can hand it to Elder Richard personally. <laughs> okay, he's back there. Okay, so, um, yeah, you can give online, and you can give, you know, personally. To Elder Richard, uh, who is in charge of our finance uh, at this time. Brother Justin will come and pray on behalf of the congregation. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the reminder this morning that our joy will be made complete in the world to come. And we thank you for also the reminder that um, you also enable us to suffer and to grieve freely but you also remind us that we don't grieve alone. You're with us, God Emmanuel, who came down to be with us. Um, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, uh, empowering us to live our lives faithfully as Christians, um, that as we, are, we suffer as Christians, that he empowers us. And we thank you for uh, his presence in our lives. And we also pray for our missionaries who are um, working for your kingdom in Australia, Jim and Claudia, as they um, minister for your people in Australia, I pray that you would strengthen them and that whatever trials and temptations they may be facing right now, that you would strengthen them and that you would guide them and that you would remind them that they are not alone. And we pray for uh, the offering that we give to you as a token of offering and thanksgiving to you. May this be used for your furthering of your kingdom and that, uh, um, that Christian fellowship may multi be multiplied throughout the world. Uh, we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, it's time for greetings and announcements. Welcome to Hope Church. Uh, if this is your first time, we have our brother, uh, our a sister and brother from our welcoming committee uh, there to greet you. Uh, it's a great way to get started to uh, you know find out what our church is about. So see them after after the service. So uh, follow them. Uh, I know a lot of our people are away. Uh, because school's on vacation, a lot of people are traveling. Uh, please be, please pray for travel mercies for uh, our people who are away traveling. Um, let's say to one another, Happy New Year. Let's say to one another, Happy New Year, as we'll have Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. <coughs> yeah, I can't believe um, year 2021 will be over soon. We thank God for his faithfulness over this past year. I uh, want to thank uh, those of you who served to make our Christmas presentation last week amazing. Uh, we're so thankful, so blessed last week. It was great. And uh, we want to thank all of you who uh, served to make our Christmas celebration lunch special as well. Thank you so, so much for serving. Today at 7.30 uh, via Zoom, we have an officers meeting uh, to go over our budget. And then next Sunday um, via Zoom at 7.30 p.m., we have a congregational meeting uh, so that the whole congregation will get to see the budget and vote on the budget. And it will be via Zoom. And it's, um, and it's uh, so, you know, the members can get to vote on the budget as well. Okay. Um, a prayer meeting is canceled uh, for Saturday, January 1st because it is a holiday. But uh, the day before that, uh, next announcement. We will have a New Year's Eve prayer service on December 31st. Um, so, so look out for the link on our Facebook groups as well as our website. Okay, we will uh, we will pray uh, to end the year and to greet the year as well. It's a great way to prepare your heart right for the upcoming year 2020, and uh, we want to we want to pray. Uh, Give thanks to God for this past year, but also pray for the coming year as well together as a body. So we want to join. want to ask you guys to join us. Uh, Phil Philip will be leading praise. Uh, we have prayer ministry leading us in prayer. I'll be giving a short devotional. Um, I want to encourage you guys to all come and join us for that. They'll be at eight o'clock. Okay. Next, I think that's it. Uh, let's all stand for the doxology. <clears throat> Praise.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You see the blessings? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father with his tender heart for you, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, go in peace. Join us for fellowship outside. There's snacks outside.